Yeah, this is Billiam Tice. I have a confession to make. I told you guys to be patient for the next Ben 10 video, full knowing I was gonna spend way too high of a percentage of my life making videos about the show Lost. But please don't be worried. That's not all I'm doing with my life right now, I swear. So about a year later, we're back talking about Ben 10. And his name is Ben Tennyson. Cartoon Network's very own superhero. Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. Ben Tennyson, the arrogant and rude but deeply caring teenage hero, is equipped with this super cool new watch, the Ultimatrix. Now activate Ben's light and sound ultimate Ultimatrix and twist the dial. Ben can not only transform into all of the other alien superheroes he's had access to in prior series, but now he can supercharge them with a new ultimate form. I've said before that I think Ben 10 is the perfect superhero for the Pokemon generation and boy oh boy does that track here. Ultimate Cannonbolt! As the third iteration of the series, Ben 10 Ultimate Alien picks up the story after Ben and friends have saved the world and the galaxy more than once and have explored many more corners of this universe. Ben is accompanied by his magically powered cousin Gwen, who inherited powers from their magical alien grandma, and the ex-half-alien convict turned powerful ally and Gwen's boyfriend, Kevin. Because he's currently half-alien, he has the ability to absorb matter. They're a fun trio with a now-seasoned history and a deep proven care for one another. Their dynamic is pretty clear, with Ben, Kevin, and Gwen all having distinct motivation toward each other and toward whatever situation they're in, making the character drama of all the episodes entertaining and fun to follow. And with a mostly episodic format, the well-paced 22-minute episodes are always putting the characters in fun, new, perilous, and action-tense situations to get out of. Naturally, all while maintaining that TV Y7 rating for Cartoon Network. Gotta sell those toys. Ben 10 toys, baby. In episode to episode, they bounce all over this now familiar universe, previously hidden behind so many secrets. Ultimate Alien takes place in a lived-in world, with characters and character motivations being assumed to be known not only from Alien Force, but from the original series, with many classic characters making their debut post-time skip. As a continuation of Ben 10 Alien Force, headed by the same creative team, Glenn Murakami and Dwayne McDuffie, Ultimate Alien is very much in the same tonal and visual world as Alien Force. Well, I think both series definitely have their low moments. I think Ultimate Alien more so seems to stagnate creatively at times, as this is now deep into the run of classic Ben 10. But nonetheless, Ultimate Alien definitely has some high moments and some very creative storylines. So let's look at the fun but very mixed bag that is Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. Before we continue, this video is sponsored by Displate. Displate is a one-of-a-kind metal poster designed to help you capture your passions. Featuring an incredible variety of designs from both familiar brands and premium artists, Displate has an incredible collection of art that will connect with you the audience. Okay, so I was really excited because they let me take home five of these things. I got to show off some of the stuff that I decided to get. First off, we got oh, Make Your World Bigger, the Discovery Channel. Oh, we didn't open these. Look at that mat. Oh, well, this one's going to be going in our office to make our world bigger. But what's really cool is all of these brands come up with custom designs just for display. Like Discovery Channel has a whole Animal Planet collection. This is going in the living room but only when I have company. But the coolest thing about these art prints being made out of metal is there's a really unique easy safe magnet mounting system. You just apply the first layer and then add a magnet to it and then you could easily arrange your display right over it. If you wanted to, you could have a big collection of these things and easily change them out from your wall. Once you get tired of that plate, you can put up this plate. I love these guys, huge animals. Most of my plates consist of huge animals. Look at this one, Hello Kitty's best hits. You gotta listen to track three. This plate is shipped in a super safe box from the EU, and once you decide you want them, they'll come quickly in four to five business days. If you click my link in the description, you can get a discount and also see a collection of Displate curated by me to recommend to you, the audience. So thank you again to Displate for sponsoring this video. Ben 10 Ultimate Alien would air seven months after its predecessor Ben 10 Alien Force, which ended in March of 2010, meaning Ultimate Alien premiered on Sunday, October 10th, 2010, 10, 10, 10, which is a pretty fun celebration despite encouraging kids to stay home from church. You're not gonna feel real cool when you're in hell, Ben 10. Also catch the series premiere of Ben 10 Ultimate Alien at 10 a.m. It's Ben 10 all day, this 10, 10, 10. As a direct continuation to the last Ben 10 series, we're immediately given a huge shakeup in Ben's life to differentiate everything. Ben is now 16, he has a car, the car from the movie, and he's now been doxxed. Aliens are real, Ben Tennyson. 
Having struggled with his ego before, Ben now receives worldwide fame as a superhero who turns into aliens and then turns in aliens. He's a famous space cop who doesn't play by the rules. He takes praise, criticism, and all. He's been outed as a one-man or should I say boy, alien invasion. Previously, Ben had been recognized by aliens for saving the universe, but now everyone he knows personally is aware of who he is, and his old enemies discover new ways to attack him through his Earth identity. While the show has proven Ben's heroic actions to truly be selfless time and time again, this season, Ben really has to work to humble himself, with many people gaining awareness of his adventures as if they've seen the show. After all the hype, the Alien X smoothie was a real disappointment. Kinda tastes like filler. This newfound outlet for Ben's ego causes friction amongst the group, episode to episode, as everyone starts becoming very aware of each other's characters. Gwen is the one who outwardly expresses the most care for the group. While she'll start arguments, it's always from a diplomatic approach, not frequently from an emotional one. Kevin has the inclination to be quick to anger and to be a scummy guy and a criminal, but he genuinely wants to reform himself for his own sake and for his newfound family. Look, you know I love money more than anything in the world, what did you say? Almost anything in the world. Having been with the group for a while now and with Gwen for a while now, Kevin really starts to understand Gwen's perspective much more when it comes to Ben. And he agrees. Ben is a jerk. But Kevin, Kevin is a jerk who works on himself. I'm trying to write this video for anyone to watch, but if you want to know my perspective on Ben 10 Alien Force, you can check out my video there to go watch the mid-rolls, I mean to see my perspective. Just like in Ben 10 Alien Force, the first major arc in Ben 10 Ultimate Alien begins with a brand new character, the ultimate comic book type of villain, Agrigor. So Agrigor, he's an Osmosian, the same kind of alien as half Kevin. He's gone to Andromeda, our neighboring galaxy, and picked up some aliens he wants to absorb, aka aggregate, five aliens that when combined will make Agrigor oh so super powerful. <laughs> the aliens he's aggregated stage an escape and crash separately on Earth. He's gotta aggregate them to become more powerful. He's Agrigor. That's what comic book villains do. They aggregate. The next Ben 10 villain should be McGuffin McGitter. So he's out here aggregating, determined to absorb the power of the alien so he'll become invincible. But the cool thing is, instead of Ben just getting a new roster of 10 aliens this time around, like the previous two series, Ben scans the new aliens he meets, not currently in the Ultimatrix's data set, because they're from Andromeda and not the Milky Way's galaxy. So a quick lore breakdown, the Ultimatrix is a knockoff of the Omnitrix, both of which have access to every single alien's DNA in the Milky Way galaxy. However, because Ben doesn't have master controls accessed, he can only transform into aliens whose species he's already met or whose transformations he's accidentally unlocked as a kid through fiddling with the Omnitrix. The cool thing is we preview a lot of the aliens first. I think in this instance, this is particularly good because Ben already has so many aliens. We get to appreciate these new aliens power sets before Ben gets access to them and then when he does get access to them it's really fun. Terraspin is a turtle with a big old fan in it. It's resistant to magical mana and has a huge fan in it. Armadillo is a big old armadillo robot that can cause earthquakes with a trembling pulverizer. Water shock is like a large crab man that can shoot jets of hot and cold water. Amphibian is an electric jellyfish that can even swim. NRG is a really hot plasma guy locked inside a protective suit of armor. A lot of cool parts of Ben 10 Alien Force and later parts of the original series saw Ben meeting aliens that were the same species of aliens he could turn into. It was just a real cool way of populating the galaxy, creating these creatures and then designing the habitat that they reside in or jobs that they have. This is sort of a reverse way of doing that. So each one is introduced as their own character with their own motivations, just to watch Ben help them navigate their short time on Earth before handing them to the plumbers, the space police to help get them home just to watch the plumbers be killed and Ben's new friends be re-aggregated by Agrigor. Imagine spending all of your time space aggregating just to have some brat Ben 10 de-aggregate all your aggregations. Aggravating. <laughs> so failing to stop Agrigor from doing his thing, aggregating the aliens, he gets his ultimate form, ultimate Egregor. Hey, isn't that Obi-Wan? even a Gregor. But why has he achieved this form? Just to beat up Ben 10, 16 year old? 
No, it's so he can go on an ultimate quest to collect the pieces of a map called the Map of Infinity, which leads to a place called the Forge of Creation where he can absorb another power to get the ultimate power. Ultimate, ultimate Egregor. Double ultimate power. With Egregor having revealed himself and powered up, the gang now directly follows his trail, trying to assemble the map before him. With the help of Azmuth and Ben 10's universe's very own Doctor Who, Professor Paradox. So they continue to fail over and over again. He's too powerful. Kevin feels a need to prevent another Osmosian's destruction. I've never seen you work on anything as hard as you're working on this case. Agrigor is an Osmosian like me. Maybe I just feel responsible. He has absorbed a feeling of responsibility. Agrigor keeps tempting Kevin. Absorb energy. Get power. Go insane. Agrigor's monstrous form reflects Kevin's monstrous form when he was a villain in the original show. Ben is feeling cocky and even more pressure with fame, especially as he continuously feeds into Agrigor. Agrigor's plans, losing to him repeatedly. Agrigor! Gwen cares about the group and wants to keep everyone together so they can focus on the mission. So here's a really cool piece of Ben 10 lore. We hear about the inhabitants of the Forge of Creation before we see them, and then it's revealed to be Alien X, which is one of Ben's transformations, his most powerful transformation, and simultaneously his most useless transformation. You see, Alien X is essentially like like a god type character. It can do anything, but in order for Ben to act as Alien X, he first must enter this little pocket dimension where he first has to debate with two celestial beings representing both love and rage, and all three of them have to come to an agreement after debating. It's a great piece of comic book writing because Ben is a character who's written continuously and we see Alien X as his potential. All he has to do to unlock unlimited power is become the voice of reason, but Ben can not consistently become the voice of reason. He's always going to battle with his ego and his emotions. Learning about aliens' powers and seeing them before populating the universe with them is really a cool part of Ben 10. It creates a mystery about their habitat and their place in the universe without even realizing it. And speaking of mystery, the reason why Agrigor is going to the Forge of Creation is because he wants to absorb a baby celestial sapien. Where do baby alien X's come from? When two constellations love each other very much. Kevin? Just trying to help the kid out. I had to learn about astrophysics on the streets. That's a very fun character beat as they go to the Forge of Creation out of the time fog walks. Baby Ben 10. It's Ben from the original series meeting Ben from this one. And I think this is a great way to remind us that Ben has really grown as a character. After Ben has reminded us once again, he can't really become the voice of reason, unable to use Alien X to save the universe from Agrigor. Ben is now an egotistical brat with a very strong desire to be kind, and he has to break his old habits. Before, Ben was a scared little brat who had yet to understand the value of being kind, and is kind of tragically forming his bad habits. Your butt is huge. What did you say? He said your butt is- I heard him! I love young Ben going through old Ben's watch. It's the perfect character interaction between the two. Dumb. Lame. Weak. Guess this one's okay. How'd you break the Omnitrix again? Young Ben also serves as a reminder for how far Kevin has come because he's expecting Kevin to be a villain. So young Ben calls Kevin a jerk and then in order to be Agrigor, Kevin absorbs Ben's powers, 16 year old Ben's powers, just how he did in the original series to be Agrigor at the suggestion of young Ben. You can absorb my Omnitrix like you did before. You'll have all my powers. Absorb energy, get power, go insane. I think this is a very natural progression to the end of Agrigor as a character. He was always being like, hey, Kevin, you're a hatchling. You're younger, you're smaller, Asmosian. You're not powerful like me. And Kevin's like, oh yeah, and then he like fought him and won instantly, but it turns out that they were all right, because Kevin knew that absorbing all the energy of the aliens would make him go crazy and become bad again, because that's exactly what happens, and young Ben's like, oh well, I was right. I forgot what his reaction, he probably didn't feel good about it. Yeah, he forgets about everything. Young Ben encouraging Kevin to absorb old Ben's powers makes Kevin revert back into his old ways. Bringing this character from the past back into the fold, it's just an interesting way to examine the the characters. You've always been a jerk. People try to be nice to you, but you can't ever see it. You're too busy feeling sorry for yourself. 
Having been turned into a monster in the original show after absorbing Ben's watch, Kevin once again does the same thing and finds himself wanting to act out on all of his mean and violent urges. Seeing our characters hurt over Kevin has good dramatic stakes. Ben and Kevin open up to each other before the defeat of Agrigor, something hard for meathead characters like these two guys to do. Ben's like, it's really been a, we've made a lot of progress as friends here, haven't we, Kevin? Like, you like us. And Kevin's like, I love you guys. Don't tell Gwen I said that. Gwen, always wanting to solve conflicts between Kevin and Ben, doesn't know what to do when Kevin starts trying to kill them. They use the word kill, something sparsely used in children's shows. I think the fact that Kevin's like their best friend, they really choose to use that word here to raise the dramatic stakes of it all. Vilgax will destroy Ben, but Kevin will kill Ben. So Ben decides he wants to kill Kevin afterwards because he's been emotionally vulnerable with him. I took Kevin, I liked him. Now he's hitting us. I'm gonna kill him. He claims it's strategic and Grandpa Max agrees with him, but he's surprised that Ben is choosing to take that route, believing Ben would normally find a kinder approach to the situation. He even ignores creative and good ideas Gwen has to save him. In this extreme way now, she has to be the mediator for these two guys who do not want her in between them. I really like what Kevin chooses to do as he's going around settling his old scores. Some of it's really petty stuff. Like imagine this gargantuan monster beating you up for five dollars. It was insane. I'm at lunch, right? And this monster shows up and says that it's Kevin Levin. He claims I owe him eight bucks that I borrowed from him five years ago, so you can see what happened next. Kevin's hit list also helps us solve the mystery of what happened to Kevin between the original series and Alien Force. Kevin learned to release the energy from his body, releasing his monstrous form that he lost before Alien Force started, and he learns to absorb matter instead of energy. Energy makes him go crazy. Matter makes him go metal. In stone and wood, and green with his car. His mentor is shot by a prison warden who Ben and Gwen rescue from Kevin crossing off names from his list, making Kevin really see them as his enemy. Gwen goes out of her way to find a solution for turning Kevin back to normal. She goes and tracks down Michael Morningstar, now Darkstar. So Michael Morningstar was the pretty guy. He'd have all the girls come over to the house and then he'd suck their energy dry. He's like a handsome male succubus, but he's all ugly unless he absorbs energy. So Gwen's like, I could heal you anytime, by the way, help us out. Bonkers moment in the Kevin arc that just blew my mind. Kevin's a monster rampaging everywhere and out of nowhere, this man walks up to him and he's like, Kevin, stop it. Put him down, Kevin. You don't tell me what to do. I said, put him down. And it's like the most emotional moment of this arc and he goes, You're not my real father. You don't tell me what to do. But you were four years old when I married your mother and I raised you like my own. And it turns out that Kevin has had this deep relationship with his stepdad this like entire time. And like Kevin like is giving him a chance for his mom's side. And he's really taking Kevin in as his own. And they had trouble with Kevin growing up, but he's doing his best. Step aside, Harvey. I'm here to see Gwen. So you can drain her powers? Max told me what you've been doing. I'm not afraid of you anymore, Kevin. And this is his first scene ever. So they're able to turn Kevin back and they thwart a quick attempt by Darkstar to absorb Kevin's powers. And there's zero consequences for Kevin or the group after this. It, they go back to normal like immediately. Mr. Smoothie, you buying? I feel like the interpersonal stakes of this story meant there should have been at least like one buffer episode where they have to like talk things through or like they're weird with each other and stuff. But like right after Kevin is done trying to like murder these people for weeks, he's like, Gwen, you know, give me kisses. <laughs> hey, since you're kissing people. It's so like, it's such a like, it gave me whiplash. Now that's what I call a happy ending. So I really think that the Agrigor arc has a very cool climax that calls back to Kevin's previous villain arc in the original series in a very satisfying way. But the ending is so bad. But that's because in the next episode, they had to get back to adventuring. Ben 10 is back on the Ben 10 Ultimate Alien, the Wild Truth DVD, featuring more aliens. I've fought your kind before. In Ben 10 Ultimate Alien 
cosmic destruction, the video game. Amphibian with lineup and spark action. So I think both Ben 10 Alien Force and Ultimate Alien lose a little bit of steam shortly following their first arc. However, the first arc is essentially just episodic stories with a through line and a climax arc at the end of it all. The filler by now is less attractive because we've already explored a lot of the world. There's a lot less mystery to it. And mystery was a huge part to the original Ben 10 stories. The finale of the original Ben 10 was called The Secrets of the Omnitrix. And a lot of that secrecy carries over into Alien Force. Like the first time we meet Ben and Gwen's grandma, amazing. She's an anodite. She's an energy being and she wants Gwen to become an energy being. And you realize how much she likes grandpa because she understands why Gwen likes Kevin. It's very charming and fun. But now that story continues with the introduction of Sunny, Gwen's bratty cousin who really wants to see her boyfriend Antonio. Is Sonny in? It's for you. I was not expecting Antonio to be this fucking character. But sometimes the expanding storylines they tell with older characters are very fun. We get a fun flashback episode where Grandpa Max meets Grandma Max. I mean, Grandma Verdona. Young Max is always a fun character. He's a more confident character than Ben for sure. And I love his quick turnaround to the idea of alien loving, a true gentleman. To me, a lot of these later stories seem like they're using the lore just to come up with new narratives rather than having the narratives and story of the show existing within the lore. And holy shit, they bring back Elena and Victor Validus from the second live action movie and Nanotech, the new alien Ben transformed into in that movie. Then we have a really fun crossover with Eon, the villain from the first live action movie, Ben 10 Race Against Time, revealed definitively to have taken place in an alternate canon. Eon, having been introduced as evil future Ben, comes back to do battle with Ben of a good future, different than the Ben 10,000 previously introduced. This is the Ben Ben grows up into after remembering meeting his future self in the original series. He also remembers this interaction now. It's a fun multiverse thing. Julie Ben's girlfriend is introduced in Alien Force, and she's definitely much more emotionally mature than Ben. She's an accomplished and pretty well-known tennis player, so while Ben is seen as this famous hero by everyone, she's angry when she's perceived as just his girlfriend. However, with a lot of Ben's personality issues, he's not really the best boyfriend. He leaves fights unresolved, and gladly takes attention from others when he sees an opportunity. Ben is often very selfish and unaware as a boyfriend, but there are personal consequences for his actions. It can be pretty good character writing. At one point, Ben really misinterprets a fight the wrong way and acts like he and Julie broke up. They didn't. Then she needs his help and he's awful about it. I feel like Ben 10 definitely has strong female characters in it, but it's written from the male's perspective always. Their relationship in the episodes serve as lessons for Ben to learn about being nice and attentive as a partner, with Ben making mistakes and facing backlash from both Julie and Kevin and Gwen. Well, a character like Kevin struggles a lot with the same issues, but is at a point in his life where he's ready to challenge himself in order to have better relationships. Look, Gwen, you have to treat a car like you treat a woman. Go on. Treat a car like you treat a woman. Go on. Treat a woman. No. I sense I've made a mistake of some kind. It makes sense. Ben would be an inconsistent boyfriend. His ego makes it hard to settle arguments with him. It's hard for Ben to break down how he sees things, but he sometimes learns from his mistakes and does better. But maybe this season needed a definitive breakup scene between the two. I feel like that should be the ultimate lesson to Ben's behavior. Charmcaster Gwen's magical rival returns as a much more strongly written character. She's not really feeling the same rage and jealousy she once felt towards Gwen, but she's still really unable to connect with them on a personal level. She goes to the special magical realm, the Ledger Domain, where she overthrows the magical overlord who killed her father. And then she absorbs all of the life in Ledger Domain to bring him back. However, he's disgusted with what she's done to revive him and uses his power to reverse the spell, giving his life for all the life his daughter sacrificed. This puts her in a new place as a powerful frenemy, as one episode puts it. It makes her villainy much more sympathetic, especially because her genocide is reversed instantly, but having her let go of her petty rivalry with Gwen is good for her character. However, there is a final beat in this series for their rivalry revisited, when Michael Morningstar, who once preyed on girls to suck up power, is now being offered 
offered infinite power by Charmcaster. Unaware of his and Gwen's history, Gwen tries to warn Charmcaster about Michael, but she's still unable to see the offer of friendship Gwen is giving her until Michael reveals himself as an asshole inevitably. She casts everyone out, unable to deal with her pain. With Kevin having been a turned villain, it's cool to watch a character like Charmcaster change more gradually. She's presented as just another character who's misguided like Kevin was and could be changed potentially, which makes her more interesting to me. I'd also like to state that I have not seen Omniverse besides a few clips. I do not know where these characters go. Ultimate Echo Echo with pullback and disc firing action. There's just a lot of really, really bad filler though in Ben 10 Alien Force. Like there's this one episode, Victor the Spoils, where Ben goes to some non-existent Eastern European country and gets involved in a civil war. Now there's a very funny episode in Alien Force where Ben goes to another planet and solves a civil war by being so bad at diplomacy that he becomes an enemy to both sides. But here it just reintroduces one of the old monster type aliens from the original series that looks like the Frankenstein monster and puts a different character who we've never met into his body and he's like, Ben 10, you've made an enemy. But he's in one of 100 episodes of this whole run. There's also my favorite storyline that every single science fiction fantasy kid show does at some point. The episode where characters clone themselves. Ben clones himself by turning into Echo Echo and then turning back into his human self in an episode. Gravity Falls does this. American Dragon Jake Long did this. Steven Universe did this. I'll find him and take him down all by myself with my bare hands. Look out. I don't really think it's that good stories couldn't be told in the Ben 10 world. They were just quickly slowing down down with the pace they were producing these at, and definitely not reaching the same creative highs as they used to. However, even Alien Force has some very weak episodes. I don't want to say this is exclusively Ultimate Alien. Solid gold poop. I also think Ben's writing is more tolerable in Ultimate Alien. His ego came back in a huge wave towards the end of Alien Force as he got galactic fame, but he deals with his fame on Earth very differently. Ben's character could be very frustrating to watch in later episodes of Alien Force. I'm really mad at you. But you won't stay mad at me. I'm adorable. However, I think Alien Force approached many of its stories more creatively. Like there's an episode in Alien Force where JT and Cash, the bullies, find this weapon left by these alien weapon masters called the Tekadons. These bullies have been with Ben since he was a kid and here they've lost power over him. And they have this weapon here that gives them actual power over Ben and a chance to beat him. It's kind of an interesting high school story. But in Ultimate Alien, the Tekadons come back and they've learned since their last fight and they're even tougher to be. And then in another episode, the Tekadon Masters come back and they want the Omnitrix. This is just the move. <laughs> I will say though that one of the Tekadon episodes is the one where Gwen and Kevin turn into Ben's aliens. Gwen, you're okay. Well. So that's kind of fun. Now activate Ben's flight and sound ultimate ultimatrix and twist the dial. However, there are a lot of standouts. This is a world we know now, and it's a world I particularly like. Having no travel restrictions inside of the galaxy with a brand new spaceship, the Rust Bucket 2, named after Grandpa's RV, we're bouncing around all the corners of Ben's world. And all of Ben's interstellar rogues gallery knows where he lives now. Ben still doesn't have the Omnitrix or Ultimatrix master controls unlocked, but he ends up getting all of the aliens he's received in the entire canon unlocked. There's a freeform nature to it all, just utilizing the whole sandbox like an open world to come up with episode plot lines. But a lot of these episodes are very fun and much of the lore's expansion is fun and interesting. I really like the episode that brings back Albedo. Albedo created the Ultimatrix, the knockoff Omnitrix, and through some mishaps, he got stuck in Ben's body because Ben's DNA is the human sample in the Omnitrix. He does not like looking like Ben. Because of Ben's fame, Albedo has been putting on a cheesy live show called Ben 10 Live. Posing as Ben. I realized that the most fitting, if ironic, choice would be to make money off of you. In hiring alien actors because he does not have access to the Omnitrix or the Ultimatrix, the Ruse, the Theatrix, the Gwennets, which is such a nod and a wink to all the different kinds of live shows that are directed at very young children. 
With Disney owning everything on Broadway, this is the only real form of legitimate theater. It's a very fun ruse for such a clever character to put on. In one episode, we're introduced to Eunice as this weird cyborg girl, but actually she's revealed to be something called the Unitrix, revealed to be an early prototype for the Omnitrix as revealed by Azmuth, the inventor of the Omnitrix. Ben kindly convinces Azmuth to keep her alive as an assistant, and Azmuth begins to more willfully agree with Ben's more kind inclinations, despite still not loving Ben's more arrogant side. There's an episode all about about the life of Gwen. She keeps a very busy schedule. She helps her mom write wedding invitations, promises her school friends to show up to a musical recital that night, friends we've never seen before or after, <laughs> and studies for a French test, all while fighting on a superhero team between it all. So magic in Ben 10 works when characters learn the real magical name of things. So Gwen's just always spitting out nonsense. I love it so much, it sounds like Simlish. Super Thecka, Super Thecka! Like Gwen sounds like she's being asked to be allowed wa, to use the bathroom. Wa, wa the highlights of Ultimate Alien are fun, episodic adventures and comic book fanfare. But Alien Force had a lot of really special character moments, the height of which I do not think Ultimate Alien gets close to. But I find myself enjoying this as much as I enjoy most superhero fare nowadays. I mean, all, all superhero stuff I watch now is hit or miss, just as hit or miss as every episode of Ben 10. But what I really love about Ben 10 format and what I really think more superhero shows need to adopt is the 22 minute format baby. With a huge universe of Ben 10 I really love how much of it gets to be explored episode to episode. With DC and Marvel now allocating budgets to their shows akin to feature films I find myself more willing to be engaged with upcoming Marvel projects not all of them but I do prefer a 25 to 40 minute show format. But what I really want to see the next Avengers project be is an episodic show like The Justice League or Ben 10 and please leave it to 22 minute episodes. So I wanna see them bouncing around, fighting all sorts of guys. One day they're gonna fight Hydra, then uh-oh, Ultron's back. Why is he back? I don't know, but he's on Mars. We're gonna go there and stop him all within 22 minutes. Superheroes are corny. No matter how much you get into the drama of it all, superheroes are still corny. And I can get into the drama of superhero stories. Have all the Avengers living in New York and wholesomely interact with the community. Like maybe, Captain America sticks up for trans youth or recognizes a flaw in himself as he tries to get an elderly citizen to stop smoking. You wanna get me to stop smoking, new Captain America? Well, stop cutting me off while we're talking. I am doing that, aren't I? I really need to work on myself as a team leader. <laughs> like, where are those Marvel projects? <laughs> I like the inconsequential nature of episodes whose stories wrap up in a single episode. And like Ben 10, you can't have an overarching storyline. There are some very solid episodic stories and villains in Ultimate Alien. I really like the reactionary cable news anchor, Will Harang. He vilifies Ben 10 in the press like J. Jonah Jameson with Spider-Man, but he's got like a Bill O'Reilly coat of paint on him. He tries to take down Ben one episode, proclaiming all the money he's spent to beat him. But then Ben just keeps destroying these really expensive battle robots Bots he's built over and over again until it like bankrupts him. Spent 14 million dollars of my own money to make sure that the menace of Ben 10 is stopped. Why I've spent 36 million dollars of my own money to put a stop to it. Ben 10 tries to frame me for the damage at the Washington Mall, but I'm not angry about that or the $170 million of my own money that I spent. Then we have the jealous, washed up Iron Man type hero, Captain Nemesis. He uses his money to orchestrate criminal activity for him to stop, but Ben always beats him to it, meaning he's spending his own money to make Ben look good. Harang then narrates a rigged charity event where Ben and Nemesis fight each other. But of course, Ben is able to reveal Captain Nemesis for the crook he is. And a fun reversal of everything in one episode, Kevin and Gwen get Ben's powers. Ben randomly selects two aliens for them to match up with. It's very charming. Also, there's this new character, Jimmy, who is the one who doxed Ben. The reason why he doxed him is because he was a big fan of him. Ben, Kevin, and Gwen all see him as a fan. And in one episode, he comes across an alien conspiracy and Kevin, Ben, and Gwen all get wrapped up into it, and it's his responsibility to solve it when nobody trusts him. Just charming little plot lines all around. And ultimate spider monkey with his powerful arm and leg action. I think I said Ben 10 was a superhero for a Pokemon generation like 30 times, but the new aliens really make me feel that way. He collects them now, but there is a complete new set of 10 introduced here on top of the ultimate aliens. So we have Fast Track, a super fast cat sort of beast. Cam Alien, a salamander-like creature with chromatic eyes that can camouflage. Edel 
Beetle, a big beetle that can eat anything and shoot lasers. Clockwork can slow down time with some sick moves. And Jerry Riggs, a creepy little freak capable of tearing apart equipment so quickly. He's the best one. Like he's a little naked guy. Honestly, with so many of Ben's original aliens returning, I think many of the new ones easily get lost in the mix. Having a lot of aliens unlocked can be very fun, but the dramatic storytelling of Ben's watch being more limited is also very fun. So many of the aliens have similar power sets. Like NRG has like really hot fire powers and Swamp Fire has fire powers and Heat Blast has fire powers and Ben has access to all of them. I like when young Ben calls Swamp Fire a wild vine ripoff and then old Ben boasts of Swamp Fire's unique power. Great guy, just a copy of Wild Vine. It's just very clear that a lot of these aliens share the same powers because they were being written to be limited use. Of course, Swamp Fire has fire powers. Ben didn't have a heat blast when he got Swamp Fire, but now he has both. Like, I don't really understand why Fast Track and Accelerate both exist, especially since Fast Track is unlocked for Ben the same episode he gets Accelerate re-unlocked for him. But truth be told, a lot of the later aliens get lost in the mix this season. Despite the heavy mix of aliens from the start, the first set of five were better introduced than the second half, which isn't to say they don't have their standout moments. I love Jury Rig, just standing near motionless and during the final battle. Starting toward the end of Alien Force, as Ben got more access to the Omnitrix's alien list, he began to get access to his older aliens. This continues, but now they have a lot of new looks. Like Alien Force and their design with Diamond Head, they continue to bring back familiar aliens with updated, fresher designs. Between them revisiting a lot of characters from the original series and bringing back these characters with new outfits, I love four arms looking like a big warrior. They're really trying to remind you of how huge this universe Universes. Of course, the new titular feature this season is Ben's ability to upgrade into Ultimate Aliens. We see a whole lot of creatures get buffed. Ultimate Humongousaur has big cannons. Ultimate Swampfire is big and he has seeds that explode. Ultimate Cannonbolt's made of metal and he'll bust into you. Ultimate Spider Monkey's got gross mouth things like a spider and he'll beat you up. But there aren't too many Ultimate Aliens introduced this season, actually. With so many of Ben's old aliens returning, this is kind of a bummer. Like, why introduce it and bring back so many old favorites? not to just watch them go ham with it. But that's all right. I think most of the ultimate aliens kind of end up being lame anyways. I think power boost is an unclever way to get an advantage in battle from a show that usually has to use an arsenal switchblade power set to figure out the best matchup for a villain or be forced to make a matchup work when Ben gets the alien wrong, which is just a creative way to put all of the aliens in the roster. I'm not even gonna talk about the sentient ultimate aliens. That's just a weird moment. <laughs> Wait. But like at one point they come to life and get out of the watch and then Asmus like, Ben, your ultimate aliens come came to life. It won't happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> then he keeps doing it. I know this concept wasn't as marketable, but I totally get way more out of seeing the updated designs of the original aliens than I do seeing the ultimate aliens. It's like Pokemon Mega Evolutions versus an Alolan form. The show starts to pick up a little bit more steam as they enter into the second arc. Beware, old George. Who's old George? Well, he's this guy, he sits around in a retirement home and he holds the badge, the badge that holds the seal of the Forever Knights, an ancient organization that that's against aliens. Boo to aliens, they say. The Forever Knights, a lot of the times, aren't really major instigators in the show's stories. They're more episodic villains that capture aliens or get alien tech and become troublesome. We've been introduced to a lot of Forever Knights leaders, but old George, he's he's walking around. He goes to Area 51. This is a restricted area, sir. I have to ask you to move along. <laughs> He whacks the guy, Area 51's no more. Old George gathers all of the Forever Knights, all of these seemingly episodic villains we've been introduced to. And he's like, you guys forgot our mission. We gotta stop squabbling, no more taking alien tech. What we're actually here to do is not to go to space to slay space dragons like the other guy wanted to in the other show, but what we're going to do here is get together and make sure the ancient dragon Dagon doesn't come back. Dagon is his name and how it's pronounced actually. So old George is this immortal from the Roman era who founded the Forever Knights to defeat Dagon, this mind controlling space dragon who once terrorized medieval Europe and probably other places too. But he once slayed Dagon, but 
now his forces are recuperating and trying to get him free. I don't remember every Ben 10 plot beat, but this time around when revisiting it, I rolled my eyes when I learned that the Forever Knights hated an intergalactic space dragon. But I think the piece of lore that got me back in is when another ancient organization is introduced, the Flame Keeper's Circle, who unlike the Forever Knights who were created to slay the Dagon, they worship the Dagon and expect his return. His minions, they're, they're interdimensional just like him and they use their interdimensional powers to fight. They do regular karate, but then they're slipping in and out and confusing you. So it turns out Azmuth and George know each other. This whole season, we're kind of learning about Azmuth's history as an inventor. And we learned that old George was once younger George and Azmuth thought he was worthy of this ultimate sword weapon he had developed. He tells Ben about the sword. He's like, Ben, you don't get it. I had this, I had the sexiest woman. She was the, so sexy, Ben. <laughs> she was like, I like science just like you, Azmuth, but I don't want to control it like you do. That's weird. And he's like, yeah, I won't try to do that anymore. But then he tried to do it and she left him. That's what happens when you think without acting. Ben's like, I would do the same thing if I was in your situation, Azmuth. And Azmuth's like, no, Ben, learn from my mistakes. So old George once used this sword to slay the Dagon and now he has to do it again because the Dagon is immortal and he was only able to damage him. But then, there's another actor. The Flamekeeper Circle attempt to recruit Ben to fight for their side, but then Ben discovers something disturbing. The Flamekeeper Circle, they believe they found the damaged body of Dagon, but instead, they've rediscovered Ben 10's greatest foe damaged after their last battle, Vilgax. The warlord turns sworn enemy to a 10-year-old, turned from Ben 10's all-time greatest threat to a troublesome rival capable of great destruction, if not watched carefully. Ben even helped Vilgax last season, not because he chose to trust him, but because he believed that if Vilgax chose to turn on them and tried to harm them, that Ben was powerful enough to stop him. Now, Vilgax seeks the power of the Dagon and must fool his servants to get it. However, Dagon psychically communicates with members of the gang and Vilgax himself, who claims he will become a servant of the Dagon. With the Vilgax of Alien Force really struggling to become a strong foe for Ben to fight, I think it's very fitting to see him in a more desperate role posing as somebody else to regain his power. Azmuth thinks Ben is more worthy to retrieve the sword, not trusting that George will be able to defeat Dagon. But Ben is like, wait, you always underestimate me. How about we don't underestimate George? And Azmuth continues to agree with Ben. So once the Dagon is resurrected, Vilgax brings out the machine, the machine that lets him absorb Dagon's powers. Now Vilgax is Dagon, Squid Dagon. After defeating George, Ben himself picks up the sword and instead of beating Vilgax as a big alien, like ultimate way big, he beats him as a knight and absorbs the power of Dagon. Vilgax is like, be a villain, Ben. Use your power to immediately destroy all evil in the universe. So Ben has the choice to use ultimate power that's not Alien X to do anything he wants to in the universe. He chooses to preserve free will instead of vanquishing all of evil from his perspective and only uses the power to reverse the destruction caused by Vilgax and Dagon. Azmuth acknowledges Ben and reverses his stance. It's not Ben that is unworthy of the Omnitrix. It's that the Ultimatrix, a knockoff of the Omnitrix, is unworthy of him. Azmuth grants him a new Omnitrix for the next Ben 10 series, the fully updated version of the watch given to him six years ago. I know Ben 10 isn't a traditional comic book character, but he's definitely been treated as such. What I love about comic book characters and long running stories are iterations. Sometimes iterations just can be completely unique one-offs, but other times iterations are so popular and well-received that they build on top of each other and become permanent elements baked into the DNA of the property. There was a bat Batman before Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, a Tony Stark before Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man. And there was definitely a Ben 10 before and after Dwayne McDuffie and Glenn Murakami's version of him. Very tragically, McDuffie passed away before Ultimate Alien finished airing, leaving his stamp on the show, and even having been a part of the development of the next iteration of Ben 10, Omniverse. The universe they helped populate is exciting and fun and interjected with relevant social commentary about the complexity of ego and geo politics and the acceptance of all identities. Their Ben is a much deeper character than K-1 
Kid Ben, being arrogant and cocky, but also clever and kind-hearted. He doesn't always put his best foot forward, but he always tries to, despite the pressure, fame, and responsibility thrusted upon him, which feeds into his ego. And with all the power he has, he really has the opportunity to enact his will onto others. But at the end of the day, Ben's kindness will always beat his ego, even when the big squid monster stands in his way. Having been the creator of Static and a defining voice in the characterization of Ben 10, McDuffie has had a huge impact on superhero storytelling, and I was very lucky to grow up with so many stories he lent his voice to. Reviewing the show is very difficult because I feel like it's clearly the second volume to One Vision. It's like when Pokemon Johto Journeys rebranded itself to Pokemon Johto League Championship. I think this show has a lot of great moments, and I really do enjoy the two big story arcs it tells and a lot of the final climactic parts of those arcs. It's just compared to the other two shows, which did feel very creatively fresh. I'll Ultimate Alien is just Ben 10 doing its thing. Now, the funny thing is I saw about 20% of Ben 10 Ultimate Alien when it was airing and I was, when I was a kid. I rewatched it for this video, but I've seen absolutely none of the next series Ben 10 Omniverse, not a single episode, maybe a couple clips on YouTube. It's a lot to cover. And I know I'm giving you guys mixed signals, but if you don't ask me every single time you watch this video to make a Ben 10 follow-up video, then I'm not gonna get to it. I know I. I told you guys last time to be patient, but this time I'm going to need you to tell me how badly you want it. Make your voice known. Get a billboard. Get a billion board. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.